You're listening to the Clutter Fairy Weekly, a weekly webcast and podcast brought to you by the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. If you'd like to participate in one of our live webcasts, please visit cfhou.com slash weekly. You'll find a calendar of upcoming webcasts, as well as instructions for joining the Zoom meeting via the app or by phone. We'd love to see you. That URL again is cfhou.com slash weekly. Now here's the weekly episode. Enjoy. Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for April 9th, 2024. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life that you want to be living. We explore the habits and the behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, and I know we have at least one new person today, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat feature, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. And we are streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can ask your questions and make comments there as well, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start by talking about last week's weekly tittle, which was called Deflect the Wrecking Ball. (laughs) The assignment was to make a plan to deflect a wrecking ball that tends to interfere with your good habits and routines when you see it start to swing your way. Let's hear from our participants in Zoom and on Facebook. Who worked on a deflection plan this week? Please let us know in the comments. YouTube viewer CM offered a shocking tale of the wrecking ball in her life. CM writes, I made the mistake of asking my husband to drop off donations, but without telling me, he hoarded years of donations at his business office. Picture frames, furniture, luggage, lamps, dishes, and even old clothing. Gail is right. I should have gotten in the car and delivered those donations myself. Lesson learned. I am so distressed to hear this story, CM. I just, oh my gosh. So now someone will have to redirect those donations when he eventually moves out of that office. Like, like So he just, he took the stuff out of your house and put it in the office. So now it has to be redone. The workload has to happen again. He definitely missed the memo about reducing the workload for anybody that's going to come and help you later. I'm, I just, I feel so bad for you. I'm very sorry to hear that story. <laughs> so CM discovered that her husband's response to her drop the donations request is her wrecking ball. The thing that derails her organizing efforts. And she decided that she needs to skip his participation altogether, which I totally agree with <laughs> and take the donations herself. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you have a workaround and the donations process will work more smoothly now. Uh, Best of luck to you. And I think going to his office, he's already moved it all to his office and trying to deal with it now, I think will just create way too much consternation because clearly he was uncomfortable with taking the donations out. And so if you remove them, then he doesn't have the opportunity to add to his collection let's let his collection go static now and then you know you can deal with that on the back end at some point when he has to get out of his office i hope he doesn't share that office with anybody i can't imagine anybody loves that he is adding things to the office if he shares it with somebody anyway that was well, a, that was a surprise <laughs> yeah and and i guess it's also a little bit of a cautionary tale about making sure that if you have a critical partner in your in your decluttering efforts that you've got at least some degree of buy-in and agreement or agreement yeah and and i don't you know it, it's 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 hard to tell from the from the post it was a short post so i you know we don't know whether he was deliberately De- de- deceiving her you know telling her oh yeah I, dro- I took all that stuff and then just mm-hmm. somehow found she found out later don't know but um mm-hmm. you gotta gotta try to get that try to get that buy-in from your spouse partner housemate whoever who at the very least needs to not make matters worse <laughs> well and you know i'm sure she enlisted him because that she had done the work 
to pull the stuff out and she wanted some support from him about the project and that was a way that he could be supportive except that he wasn't actually um making it happen right like he wasn't yeah. really supporting the project he was just preventing her from completing what she wanted to be done now what i don't know is was she giving away things that he didn't agree with was she giving away his things without his consent like I, we don't know right 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 what the dynamics yeah, are around the things story, that we're leaving right. but it sounds to me like Everything she sent out of the house, he took to his office. And some of that stuff has to have been hers. So clearly he is coming at it from a standpoint of he wasn't comfortable letting go of things that he thought still thought were valuable or, you know. And so he put a lot of physical effort in to take all that stuff to the office. But wow, somebody's going to have to unwind that on the back end. So, mm -hmm. and I'm guessing it's not going to be him. So somebody else is right. going to suffer this <laughs> project later and that's you know that's a problem um sorry m we're all sorry for you <laughs> m commented my husband stuffed two 10 by 30 lockers then died oh yeah that's so oh. tough and a 10 by 30 space is that's huge. really big right yeah. like that is a lot of space that's a like, house you know, that's that's a house you know that right there can be a house full it's a volume, it's more, yeah, more that's, a full, that's comparable to a house, yeah. I mean, yeah. a standard storage locker is usually 10 by 10 for a regular size, and that's a big bedroom size, right? And so 10 by 30 is just a lot of space to pack in. Sorry, sorry, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Ginger, why you need a you know, backup. Ginger says, I collect items to donate, but they sit in my garage. So I add drop donations to my monthly plan and to my regular week regular weekly errand list that is exactly what you need to do because it is an errand that needs to be completed because if it's in the garage it's just dying out there in the garage so um you know time to let it go and take it the rest of the way and people have trouble with that last step because it requires putting things in the car and driving somewhere specific that you wouldn't be going to for any other reason but it really is a lot quicker than you think they you know they recognize that it's a annoyance and it's a hassle and and you know wherever you go they're going to try to help you offload and get it out of there as fast as possible so it, and you know it'll be people that are available to be helpful when, when you haven't had any help anywhere else you know somebody can come and look and take the things out of the car for you without any problem so uh, take advantage of the little extra help and and go run that errand elizabeth, elizabeth said my dad's three storage units were full of furniture and big items, surprisingly easy to purge once the decision got made. Yeah, um, thank goodness. Naomi said, when I sold my husband's country place after he died, I negotiated with the buyers that we could just leave everything in the sheds and bin and bins. The valuable stuff more or less balance out, balanced out the junk to be cleared. So you left the project for them as an as-is sale. Yeah. That works as long as the family's comfortable with it. Like, there you go. Then they can tear it apart and do what they want with the rest. And for them, it's, you know, a treasure hunt instead of <laughs> a, a lifelong chore that they've been, you've been ignoring. So um, good job. That works. All right. Let's uh, get on to our main topics or our, we have, we actually have three topics today. This is an, mm. this is an ask us anything episode where we've, dug into survey responses and other sources of input and we're going to start with the topic of how much lining does an empty nest need <laughs> audience member aaron g asked us to talk about the challenges of the empty nest years how much you you should keep for your little birdies while they're testing their wings so we're going to talk today about the difficult decisions and challenges people face as they transition from a full house to an empty nest so let's start with the survey responses for this one first. Um, we asked our audience to choose from among several statements about their empty nest status. 35% say, I have no human children. 32% say, I'm an empty nester whose kids have taken all or most of their belongings with them already. Yay. 18% chose, I'm an empty nester who still stores a significant amount of my children's stuff in my home. 12% uh, said other, which we will reflect in various places in the conversation. 4% uh, say, I'm not an empty nester yet, but I expect my kids to leave in the next few years. So they have young adult children. And we have nobody that answered the survey is a parent with small kids. Um, 
they're too busy <laughs> chasing they're, they're, their small right. kids around to answer a survey. They answer a sur- exactly. Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> they're instead of answering the survey, they're bathing their child. Right. So they, they're busy. So of this audience uh, of the survey responders, 67% of you are past this problem because you either don't have kids or the kids are long since gone. The rest of you have some skin in this game. Um, we like to include an other option on our multiple choice questions because it often turns out that there are more categories than the ones that we, we come up with when we're thinking about the survey. Um, for example, Elizabeth didn't fit into any of the choices we offered because she said this, I was an empty nester for two years and both daughters are back home and I expect them to leave the nest again within the next couple of years. So she had a rebound situation with her daughters. They left home and they came back and then hopefully they're going to leave again. <clears throat> I think all parents dream and hope for their children's successful launch from their childhood home to start their own lives in their own spaces. The truth is these days, young adults are finding it harder to step into their own lives. It's hard finding a job and it's expensive to live on your own. Many kids step out from home to start working or go to college only to find that they can't maintain their life on their own quite yet. So some parents are experiencing those rebound kids that she described, those who leave for a year or two and have to come back to save money or to survive during a job search or to go back to school for a master's degree. Other kids manage to get out on their own, but they're living in small, affordable accommodations, often sharing with a roommate, so they don't have much storage space, usually in the, the places that they can afford to live. Sometimes the kids are expecting to spend their first five or 10 years moving a lot for work or trading jobs quickly as they learn their field or trying out several cities until they find where they prefer to live. From an organizer standpoint, I think parents should think of the first launch as a test run, a temporary vacation from living with your kids. (laughs) They might be back. At the very least, you might need to keep belongings store for them for a few years. And so they can afford a place with some storage capacity or until they settle down somewhere when the thrill of wanderlust and constant job shifting wears off. I was never one of those people. I didn't want to change jobs a whole lot. But even I, you know, when you're young, you take this job for two or three years and then you, you know, go find a different one. You want to earn more money. You want to get a different job title. And so you shift a little bit more early on. I think I moved five or six times between high school graduation and finally settling down for a while in in a house for a long time oh yeah in the heights right yeah yeah so ginger gave this response to the question about her living situation and she said before our daughter moved out she packed all of her leave behind in air quotes belongings into a large rubber tote and we didn't ask her to do that it was her idea great idea Um, the tote was stored in the bottom of a closet for a few years And it contained all her trophies and medals, her photo albums, keepsakes like gifts from friends and old boyfriends, souvenirs from trips, et cetera. All the things that are sort of adorning the walls and the counters in your bedroom when you're in high school. She married, moved out of state, had our first grandchild, and then moved back to our state. And when we went to visit them in their new home, we took the tote to her. And my my initial response after reading that was, where she promptly opened it and threw away three quarters of the contents <laughs> of the tote. <laughs> but it was a, it was a, her story is a great example of what happens with the stuff that a kid left behind. So you should plan to hang on to the kids' personal items they left behind for a bit. Uh, but I recommend a total repackaging of those items as soon as they've gone the first time, just like Ginger's daughter did by herself. Uh, if your kids don't do it themselves, then I would suggest that you do it for them. Don't leave their bedroom as a shrine to their growing up. Once they leave for their new job or graduate from college, a good first step would be dismantling their bedrooms and boxing up items that were left behind. If they're game to help you, then you might ask them to sort through a box or two when they come home on the winter break, during college, or over the summer. Don't expect them to get through all the room's contents in one sitting or even one visit. It's all sentimental for them, and it'll take some time to sort, to filter and make choices of what to keep. <clears throat> you can help by packing the items in categories, and respecting everything in the room is a decision that the kid needs to make. Something that you think is obviously trash may have some sentimental attachment, so 
Don't filter anything, just sort it and box it. This will be their first big experience of letting things go in response to the changes in their lives. And they need to make all those choices themselves. You might also wait a bit before you repurpose their old bedrooms. <laughs> a college kid will need that bedroom during school breaks until graduation. But a kid that went straight to work hopefully won't need that spare bedroom ever. If you think there's any chance there'll be rebound kids, and I, you know, I'm just going to pause it here that you know your own kids, right? You might box all their stuff as a sign that their lives are moving to the next step. You can leave the bedroom set up so that they can stay with you occasionally when they visit, but in a now guest room instead of their room, in air quotes, from their childhood. Box memories and a bedroom that is now guest quarters reflects the changes in their lives. Once you feel they're stable in their adult life, then you can convert the bedroom from the guest room to that craft room you're dying to have <laughs> or <laughs> exercise room or, you know, everybody makes those rooms into a million things. Right. right. A place, a place to put your uh, exercise equipment and then drape clothing over it. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> exactly. So it's just a, you know, it's just a cautionary tale. They leave house. They intend to leave house for good, but they don't realize that it's not quite going to be as easy as they think. And so if you have any feeling that your kid may not be super successful on their own in the beginning, you might want to, you know, keep it as a bedroom, but change its nature, pull all the stuff and park it in, you know, in totes in a closet and let them have those. Like you don't, th you, you can say to them, I didn't throw anything away. I just boxed it. It's all here. And so then they can go through it at some point and make those things disappear. And they may not be able to do it, you know, first semester out of the gate when they go to college or the first job out of the house. So just anticipate that there might be a few years of transition and, and then it'll be uh, something that you have to live with for a little while before it completely leaves. Connie wanted to know, Gail, um, and also me, how much did you leave at parents? <laughs> it's a little hard to remember. It's been a while. It's been a while. So I moved out um, <clears throat> and rented an apartment my first semester of college. I had a roommate and I never went back. I never went to live in my mother's house again. And I can't, I don't, I think I was, I didn't leave a bunch of stuff. I took my stuff with. Yeah. I took most of my stuff off with me to college and there were, um, you know, three younger sisters all queued up wanting a room of their own. And so right. my, my and they're room, like, was, I need that my room, room brother. was no longer my room after I went to left for college. Like 36 so hours later. <laughs> when I came, you know, when I came, was back for visits, I was sleeping on, on a couch or some in someone else's room that, that they'd given up so I could have a place to sleep. And then I think, I only I was only back with mom and dad for a few months in the summer after college graduation before I got a place of my own and then took I think mom I had taken everything except maybe you know my my childhood artwork and such you don't really need yeah. that stuff in your college dorm room no <laughs> yeah I know not really but I think when I when I ultimately, you know, when I got my first real place that was just my own after college, I took all that too. Well, and As my mother actually moved away. Um, yeah, my parents did too. My parents from, moved, yeah. left Houston while when I was in college. Mom did too. So she moved, when my little sister went off to college in San Antonio, my mother moved to Dallas. And so for a job. And so I'm sure she didn't take anything of mine to Dallas with her. I'm sure that was like, yeah, yeah, here's this stuff. I'm out. <laughs> um, Ginger says, daughter is much like her father, King Chunkit. I'll ask, her, <laughs> I'll ask her what happened to that stuff, the stuff in the tote. I'll bet much of it was tossed. Yeah. And she says, by the way, I was queen keeps a lot. <laughs> Love those names. King, King Chunkit. And Queen keeps a lot. That's awesome. Let's uh, go to Anne for a question before we move on to our next topic. Okay. Anne, go ahead. You'll have to unmute yourself and then. Thank you. Hi, Thanks. Anne. My, my child has been home several times. He lives in another state. 
And he has only taken things that are small enough to put in his suitcase. I still have two closets full of things that are his that I have no use for, and I'd really like to be able to use those closets. He is married and has a child, has children. Mm -hmm. um, do I have the right to throw those things out? I think that I would tell him that you intend yes, to do that. But what if he then says, no, don't? <laughs> then tell him that he needs to make arrangements to take it with him. And so I would say, box it up and prepare to ship it. And that he needs to pay to ship it. That that peeling off a little bit of stuff every trip he visits is not enough for it's you. <laughs> and that we we just need to move it to him. Um, You don't want to... You can, I mean, I've had people do this project where they they go to work on it. They send photos to the kids and the kids say yes or no based on the photos that they're seeing, what needs to go be shipped to them or what not. But I would say, um, yeah, OK, you you're grown. You're a married man with a child. This is your stuff. And I'm and not your storage unit. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. it's time to to move the rest of your things to you. And so either back, you're going to take care of it and make it happen. When I went back home to try to reclaim my Lionel train set, it had been sold for a pittance. Oh. oh. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like without my knowledge and consent, which is why you can't, you know, throw any of his stuff out. You have to ship it to him and it's going to, it's going to be an expensive moving thing, but that's the only way you're going to be able to keep your, like, he's never going to take it all out with him in a suitcase. So no. you're going to have to pay to move it there. And then, you know, it's his problem what he does with it, whether he keeps it or not. But you haven't given away any of his things without consent. So you're honoring that he owns it, but you're going to have to, you know, move it like a moving project. And you should do that because it it is your closets and you need them and you want them. And so yeah. he's he's got his own house and he can he doesn't need to store with you anymore. And that's not unreasonable. And just, you know, inform it ahead of time. These are coming. And, you know, here they come. Thank you for that, Ann. And good luck. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on to our sec second topic because we still have lots to cover here. Um, this one is Earth Day decluttering. In a recent survey, audience member Christine wrote, I would love your ideas on picking one area of decluttering to celebrate Earth Day. I think I'm buying too many clothes. I think the solution would be to spend some quality time with the clothes I already have, like for me to organize and store them better. Mm. Your advice to stop buying more stuff is the most important as and has become a mantra for me. And your, invite, your advice on putting things out on the curb or donating is so much better than it going to a landfill. 100%. So I love the idea of spending quality time with your closet. It's great. A great visual and reminding yourself what you already own and love and what is ready to be recycled or donated away there's lots of ways to recycle textiles now um, for instance goodwill takes clothes and linens that aren't okay for resale and they do cotton recycling there so it gets bundled up and sold to somebody as cotton recycling for um, there's all kind of manufacturers that are using it as stuffing as rags as they have uh, secondary purposes insulation a paper it gets uh cotton gets recycled in, into uh paper paper making more paper well. yeah mm -hmm. yeah so mm -hmm. there's um that that is one of the things that get happens with cotton stuff that goodwill gets that they can't really sell um and th and there's lots of other textile recycling available um recycling programs that are that s cities do specifically uh, one of the cities in our local area has a special textile recycling bag and so they give the homeowners the, that textile bag and they're allowed to put clothes in it and then sit it out to the curb next to the recycling bins. And so those get um, packaged and, you know, get gathered and, and recycled as a secondary uh, recycling type. So it's Earth Day is a great trigger. It's perfect time to go do some research about your area and see who or how you can recycle excess textiles. Then jump in your closet with the intent to pull out those donatable clothes and the items that can be recycled and make it a project to send several bags to your favorite charities and to textile recycling and keeping them out of landfill in honor of Earth Day. No, we don't want to keep them in the landfill. We right. definitely don't. And so do a little, how how can I textile, recycle textiles in my area? 
you know, Google that and see what you, what's available, what company who's doing what in your specific area. You'll be surprised. Something's going to pop up. Earth Day this year is on April 22nd. So we're a few weeks away. It's an annual event that started in 1970 and it's grown over the last 50 years or so. And what the website calls the biggest civic event on earth. Typical acti activities include tree planting and environmental cleanup events and education and environmental literacy program. This year's theme is plastic, uh, planet versus plastics. And, and I would say it seems like a perfect year to look at your chemical recycling, the chemicals that need to be dropped off to tox toxic chemical reclamation. Uh, there's usually anybody that has a recycling city program also has a shunt off to handle toxic chemicals. And that'd be a very Earth Day cleanup kind of thing to do as well. So it might be the perfect time to try to make that errand happen before April 22nd, that you go take all your toxic chemicals and drop them off responsibly where they can be reclaimed or disposed of properly. So let's look at some survey responses here. We asked our audience what environmental or social issues most concern you with respect to your efforts to declutter, organize, and maintain your home. And Annie said, I've always been considered a penny pincher, so I use up everything as much as possible. And when we do need to replace something, we try to get a replacement that's environmentally friendly as possible and don't come with packaging that we can't recycle. That's super helpful. Those items we declutter are donated to an organization that helps our community. So you've sort of wrapped in your um, environmental response to how you shop, how you use, and how you redistribute or recycle things on the back end. So good for you. You're uh, addressing it from all of the uh, sources that possible. So as long as you're not drowning in stuff, we're okay. <laughs> right. AG says, I try not to be too wasteful. I'm not perfect. Sometimes things just need to be gone. I like fair trade or other socially conscious products where I can or ones with reduced packaging, although that's not enough to balance my Amazon packaging. <laughs> but my household is chronically ill and can't drive. So I try not to beat myself up too much about that. That's great. I think that, you know, sometimes things need just need to be gone is a, is a reasonable response. It's It's, you know, you can if you can get really bogged down in feeling guilty about or, you know, anxious or guilty about where your stuff is going and what's happening to it. And we always encourage people to just you know, do the best you can. Um, and if, if you're making some effort instead of no effort, uh, the, you know, it's clutter fairy world and effort counts. So if you're trying to do it, it seems like you're giving what you can with the, with the energy and the capacity that you have. And that is great. Um, and I would say because you have a bunch of Amazon packaging, then I would uh, get on next door or some other local uh, message board. And every once in a while I'll say, who needs boxes? I got b bunches of boxes for free. And then you can funnel boxes off to people that are trying to move or pack or ship or whatever. Uh, I'm sure there's somebody, and as particularly now in the spring, everybody moves in the spring and summer, right? The majority of moving takes place in this time of year. And so make them available here come and pick the boxes you want let people come to the house and go in the garage or go on the front porch and take boxes away for you they'll get reused and hopefully on the back end uh, get recycled after they're done with them from the move maybe they'll offer them back up to the next person in line that's got moving happening so um, if you are not able to quite manage it because of your physical capacity then you know, you just need to find a mechanism to rope other people in to come and take your boxes away and use them again. Um, an anonymous, anonymous responder said, I try not to buy a lot of temporary seasonal stuff, just what I need, which is great. And I think it is a shift in our consumer behavior that we don't go in and buy it just because it's cool or cute or in this season. We buy stuff that we need and then stop there. And that's always... Uh, you know, the car is always racing down the road. We we always want to be buying more stuff, but the older that you get, the more wanna, that stuff becomes an annoyance on the back end. So I want to share another comment uh, kind of in the same vein from Selena. She said, so much junk is produced that really shouldn't be purchased and should be boycotted instead. For example, mm. 
event and holiday co decorations or costumes. She says, I'm a profound believer, but the amount of glittery junk in the season just annoys me. <laughs> Putting right. a big expletive deleted Christmas tree with tons of garbage plastic that people manufactured in sweatshops won't make anyone a better Christian. Sorry. Oh, uh, there you go. And um, I, I, so it's a little more extreme version of uh, what the, the anonymous respondent said. But yeah, I think taking a hard look at anything temporary, seasonal, short term that you're tempted to buy and you know, think hard about it. Does, does, yep. this, does this thing I'm going to put out for, for three weeks really need to take up space in my home and then ultimately a landfill <laughs> you know well and and to make it and to be a project an item that i have to manage and keep up with and store and all that does it really deserve um storage space in my house yeah 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 aaron says i feel guilty throwing things away we try to buy good quality items repair rather than replace and wring out every bit of usefulness We've been rescuing items for years, planning to use them on our homestead for some creative project or other that we never actually undertake. I don't want to live in a landfill. And Aaron, you are highlighting a really important point. In our efforts to keep stuff out of landfills, we have to be careful that we don't gradually turn our own living and storage spaces into a landfill instead. If you are just temporarily parking them in your space, on the way to the landfill, <laughs> then you're kind of back in the landfill up into your house. And so rescuing them is probably not the best solution. Uh, you might be able to go through your house and look for the things that you thought you were going to use them for something that you're not actually going to use them for. Um, maybe you can categorize some of those contents and find a better way to donate them, put a little research, put some of your effort into finding the next place that those can be useful instead of just holding on to them so they don't go out to the garbage because they will go out to the garbage when you pass away if you haven't tried to reroute them in the meantime and so a i would stop rescuing things and worry about the things that are in your house and then when you backed out of all of the extra stuff in your house found a new place for it whatever you're going to do with it um, then i would come up with some categories of things that you feel comfortable being in charge of rescuing and then relocating. I'm going to grab this recycling and then I'm going to put it in the recycle bin. I'm going to bring this item home and I'm going to donate it to the school. I'm going to, you know, like that part of your rescue plan needs to be that you only pick up certain times of thing, types of things that you have a plan already in place to deal with them. And it isn't, pick it up and bring it home it's pick it up and execute an, another just redistribution method to put it somewhere that can be reused and not be going in the trash yeah you have to break that cycle of rescuing everything that you see as having some kind of potential because that's a recipe for you to drown i'm sure it's too so, much too much uh, uh uh, let me finish with a comment from Terry that okay. I think is really good. Terry says, I try to be gentle with myself myself about disposing of stuff I already have. Mm. Agree that sometimes things just have to be gone. I agree that my house shouldn't be the landfill, but I also take time to think about what behaviors I can change so I don't end up in this situation again. Exactly. That's exactly right. And it's always, you know, the instinct is, oh my gosh, that can be used but if you if that's the end of your thought process, if you stop with that can be used by somebody sometime, then you haven't taken it far enough. You haven't created a workable plan for that item to be actually rerouted. So don't want to rescue everything and you know do the best that you can and don't make your house the landfill. Because <laughs> your kids are going to yell at you when they have to clean out your house after you're gone. All right, I'm going to pause for a special announcement before we go on to our third topic today. And that is, we want to say a special thank you to Christy, PJ, and Julie for becoming our newest Patreon supporters. Thank you, you so much. If you'd like to help support our efforts with a recurring monthly donation, please visit cfhou.com slash Patreon. Your contributions help us offset the costs of producing the weekly webcast and will help us fund new projects that we have in the works. Thank you for your support, Julie, PJ, Christy, and all of our generous underwriters.
Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. We do this work for free to the public and there is, there is expenses involved to running this show. So thank you so much for your support of our work. We appreciate you. Uh, I have a question, a follow-up question um, for you before you move on. Okay. Um, can you clarify for Anne um, that was asking about her grown married son's things, who should pay for those things to be shipped to him? I feel like he should pay for the, his things to be shipped, not the mother. I hope she can find freedom and not guilt and want to get his things out of her home. Um, I would prefer for him to pay for it, but I would not prefer to have the project derailed waiting for that. <laughs> so it depends on, it, you know, if he, if they can have a conversation about it and she can say, okay, I want the closets. You have your own house. You need to have your stuff and I'm going to ship it to you. Then are you willing to pay for that? Or maybe you can agree that both of you will pay for it. Like you'll cost share, um, be, you know, he can pay part and you can pay part or whatever. Maybe you can hire somebody to fill the U-Haul and drive it to where he is. Like maybe there's some, uh, you know, relative that wants to go visit and can pull a U-Haul to him um, with his stuff. Like there, yeah. there's probably some cost effective ways to make it happen, but um, cause shipping a whole lot of stuff is going to be expensive, but I think it's worth it to ask whether he's willing to cover it. And, it, you know, if he gives you a, a problem, ask the cost split. And if he's not willing to do that, then you're like, okay, I'm, you know, I will pay for it, but I'm making it happen because we're not, don't, you don't want that. <clears throat> who's going to pay for it to shut down the process. Right. Completely. Let's go on to our third topic, which is, which we're calling indoor outdoor work balance. Audience member Kathy asked us to talk about how to keep indoor declutter momentum going while adding spring outdoor chores to the mix, all while having a full-time job. So we asked our audience, what outdoor activities tend to take time away from your indoor chores in the warmer months? Um, the first one, the first list was gardening, lawn care, planting, weeding, landscaping, and related chores were the most frequent answers we received to this question. Uh, and Leah wrote mowing, mowing, gardening, and more mowing. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly uh, mowing is in your future. I see uh, that will certainly take time away from your indoor decluttering. So make plans to keep up your indoor maintenance and then work on new organizing projects. When you come back inside to escape the heat, recognize that the amount of hours you can devote to it is split now between your outdoor work. So during this season, when the demands of the yard are greater, your organizing project will move slower. That's okay. Priorities can shift. Keep it going in a smaller way. And when the outdoor work slows down, you can increase your attention to your indoor projects again. Several survey respondents listed various forms of outdoor exercise in their answers, such as walking, hiking, and swimming. Evelyn wrote, playing volleyball, going for walks, and going to the swimming pool. You have to take advantage of the better weather to enjoy outdoor exercise. Again, no worries about that. Just keep your maintenance going so you're not making new clutter if you can. Then work in a smaller way on organizing projects until this season has passed. A few audience members have worked out for themselves how to add in outdoor fun while still keeping up the indoor responsibilities. PJ wrote, just being outside in the warmth of the sun. It's wonderful to feel the sun and the breeze and listen to the birds after months indoors. I have to get up early to do the indoor chores, then do the outdoor chores while it's getting warmer. Then I can relax in the afternoon as a massive reward with a coffee, a puzzle book, a snoring dog, and a comfy pillow. <laughs> I thought that that sounded really blissful and very balanced. Great job, PJ. You did a good job there. She's working it out, so she's getting up earlier and doing some of the indoor chores early in the morning and then going to do outdoor things and then coming to collapse in the afternoon. I thought that's a, that's an executable plan. Sounds Good nice. job. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, others report difficulty in making the adjustment to warm weather mode. Sandra says she enjoys sitting outside to enjoy longer evenings with a glass of wine, but the dishes don't get done as diligently. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra, you might want to uh, make that out wine outdoors a reward for doing the dishes during the season. Since the evening's longer, you can go out there a little bit later and still enjoy a nice time after the dishes are complete. <laughs> I mean, truthfully, it's going to take you half an hour. So just take a half an hour of your evening time 
uh, finish the dishes so you don't have to worry about it and you don't have to feel like you're not doing a good job and then go drink on your patio guilt free <laughs> so it's going to be pretty outside the, the weather's going to be nice then you can star watch when the sun goes down and so i think uh, you can make it work just make the make the wine outside the reward for finishing the dishes and then you know it'll be a chore that is complete i think this question is mostly about recognizing the finite number of hours in your day and making conscious choices about what to trade off as you add fun outdoor activities to your routine. If the trade-off is doing less organizing and less of the other housework, your home's going to reflect that. So if you're adding a half an hour of gardening to your daily routine, you might need to cut back how much TV you watch or another leisure activity so that your clutter maintenance tasks don't get derailed. Enjoy your fun and sun and aim to keep things from getting worse as a minimum. Clutter will be there when you have more time again, so don't give up completely. Instead, just slow down the organizing work so you don't make your project more of a burden when the weather drives you back indoors again. I wanted to ask you about the NAPO conference. The NAPO conference was in lovely LA this year. We were in Long Beach. Uh, it was quite lovely and beautiful and clear, and the temperatures were cool and not like at home at all. It was, it was quite fabulous. And uh, we had a good time. It was a good crowd and really great education happening while we were there. And I need to give a shout out to a fellow organizer who I met accidentally at the summit last week. I sat down at one of the lunch meetings in the main hall. We have a, um, um, like an annual meeting with all, so everybody comes together. And I was sitting next to a person that had a first timer ribbon on their badge. They have a, we have a badge with a bunch of ribbons at the bottom and she had a first timer ribbon on. She sat next to me to chat for a little bit. And then she said, you look very familiar. <laughs> and she looked at my badge and said, are you the clutter fairy? <laughs> yes, that's me. So it was a very funny moment. And um, so I'm saying hi to Laura Scorich of Just Focus and Reorganize, who I met in sunny LA by accident. <laughs> Thanks for watching my channel as an organizer. I'm always honored when I learn that a fellow organizer is following my channel. She specifically mentioned... Um, me and Ed playing in the background in her house. So she said hi to, she said hi to Ed as well. It was lovely to meet you. And thank you so much for watching the channel. It was great to, great surprise to happen at the conference. There's a lot of chatter in the chat about Anne's issue, her son's stuff. And mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> people are kind of coming down on, on both sides of, he's left it with you for so long. You should just, be done with it and no you have to be you need to be conscientious about making sure that you consult his needs um linda says i've paid shipping to make stuff go away to somebody who wants it and also frequently deliver to someone local that's you know giving away getting rid of stuff to yeah. other people not you know not specific like this yeah yes it should be on them but i want it gone for good worth it to me to make that happen now Right, and, I think uh, so too. Susie says, if the son isn't willing to pay to have it shipped, then he doesn't want it enough, and maybe it should just be sold or donated. So I get that response. I get that that would be a take that you would make, but I, I also want to say, you know, newly married young child, like you know what it's like in a household when you're working full time and you have a little kid at home. Like they, they have a lot going on at their house, so. And I'm sure that money is tight when you're young and you have little kids, your cash flow is not the best it's going to be in your lifetime. Let me just say that. So <clears throat> it may be a financial burden for him to participate, or it may be that he doesn't have the bandwidth to think about it. Like he's got other stuff going on and his mother is asking him to think about something that he doesn't feel like he has the bandwidth and mental capacity to think about, which is fine. And that stuff shouldn't change her ability to make her decisions about her own house. And so right, right. I think it's worth, even if he won't participate, I think it's worth spending the money for it to go to him and to become now his problem. And if how he deals with it is he puts the boxes in the garage. That's up to him. Like he doesn't have to do nothing with it, but I think it's at the, at the bare minimum you have to respect the fact that he left it there and it's his and that 
you don't need to make decisions about it because you don't want to be in the position of my mother threw something away without my consent. Like people feel betrayed by that and they hold on to those wounds right. as long-term damage. And so, yeah, and, and, and we, we surveyed you don't want to sour on, the relationship. We surveyed on that topic some months ago and a lot of people in our, in the, in this community, a lot of people who listen to our, listen, watch or listen to our show <clears throat> had experience, you know, negative experiences of something important to them that got thrown away or given away or disappeared. And um, so communicate, communicate, communicate. And mm -hmm. yeah, and, I mean, uh, if you're going to do it and you're going to do it without their participation, you at least have to honor the fact that it's their stuff and you're making a choice to do something without their participation. That means you don't get to filter it. You don't get to throw stuff out, you know, dead food. I would throw out dead food, but right. Right. You know, if there's something in the mix, it's obviously dead, but well, otherwise I would say, trash. yeah, right. Like don't make any choices for them, honor their right to own whatever they want to own and make no judgments about whether it's trash or not. It's up to them to make that judgment on the other end. And, and if that's as much as you can do for them, at least you are honoring their ownership while also taking care of yourself and your own space. And so she can make a choice. I I want those two closets empty. I live in this house and I want to use them for my stuff. You have your own home and it's appropriate for these things to be with you. And therefore I am going to get them to you. However, that takes place. And what you do with it on the back end is your deal. And, you know, I'm sure in some people's minds, it's like, Oh my gosh, my mother is sending me this stuff and I don't want to think about it or deal with it or look at it. It's like, that's okay. I'm going to honor the fact that you don't want to make decisions right now. And I'm going to send it to you so that you can house it while you don't make decisions. You can keep it while you think about it. And I can have my closets back. Like I don't want to spend another 25 years without the use of these closets because you can't be bothered to make choices in the moment. That's fine. I'm going to move those lack of choices to you to house until you're ready. And in the meantime, I'm going to reclaim my closets. So I think it's, you know, we do have to honor their ownership, but we don't have to keep it while they think about it. Yeah. They can keep it while they think about it and you can have your closets back. And like she said, like the other person just said, it's worth the shipping money to make that change for yourself and to reclaim, you know, it's worth the money you're going to spend to honor his ownership and to reclaim your space at the same time. And um, it, it'll be money well spent in the end because you'll do it one time and then you will never see those things again. And whatever he does with it is his, his choice. Um, M brought up another aspect of, about emptiness. Uh, she says, there's also the problem with keeping stuff that the child doesn't want because it means something to us as the parent. How do we know how much is too much? So, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, a lot of times parents... Because parents remember, you know, the little kids when they're small, the little kids aren't, the tape recorder's not recording a lot of that when they're little, right? And so um, the little kids don't remember stuff. And the mom is like, oh my gosh, you hug this teddy bear every day of your yeah, life. You, you know? never let go of this little you car. You never let yeah. go of it, right? And so it's not a surprise to me that um, parents find attachment to things that the kids don't even remember handling. And so uh, how much is too much is you can't keep it all. Um, this is definitely an area where you need a representative sample. So all of those things remind you of when the kid was little, but you can probably pick one or two or three things that you feel really attached to. And the rest of them are not as important or emotional to you as um, those few things. And so you want to aim for, the biggest emotional bang for your buck, the ones that you have the most sentimental attachment to and the, the ones that you have less sentimental attachment to, let them go. And if you find yourself keeping a whole lot, then, you know, worry about getting out what you can let go of now and then make a plan to come back for another pass again and to shrink that population as they get older and move along, right? Like pretty soon there's going to be grandkids and then you're going to be keeping all the grandkids stuff. You need to get to get your kid stuff down to a population that is a right size for you. 
and um, and hopefully not keep everything. A lot of moms save everything because they think they're going to deal with it later or the kids are going to want to see it and they save 100%. And then the kids are completely overwhelmed with how much they sent. Like talk about making you crazy when your mom ships you, you know, 14 boxes of moving boxes full of stuff from your childhood that you don't even remember. So you, you definitely need to filter that stuff. And keep what you love. Let the rest move along. Rowan said sh shipping the stuff could be considered a gift to him. There and, you go. And Marsha added, that's a wonderful idea. Reframing your thoughts. You will both feel good then. I really, really like the idea of sending him photographs and asking him what he wants sent first, though. Win, win, win. Right. And that's, you know, I do that with people with the text. Like we take a photo, send a text message. This is in the closet. Or do you want this or do you, or can I donate it? And, yeah. you know, nine times out of 10, the answer is yes, you can donate it. And so th then you're seeking permission. They're seeing the actual thing. They're going, oh my gosh, mom, I can't believe you still have, have that. Let it go. And so then the mom can feel guilt-free. They ask the question, they got permission and it can go out of the house. And so um, now a kid is not going to let you sit there and send them 50 photos in one sitting, right? So you're going to need to send, you know, here's five things I want you to make judgments calls about. And then, you know, another day come back and here's 10 more or five more or whatever. You're going to have to incrementally let them look at stuff. But at the same time, every time they see a photo and say, no, I don't want that. That's one more thing you can let go guilt free in the donation pile. So um, worth the time and effort to, you know, give recognize their agency over their own stuff. Like just because they left it behind doesn't mean they don't feel sentimental or attached to it. And so it's worth it to say. Do you still want this stuff? Like they're not going to, they don't remember when they see a picture, they might go, oh my gosh, that's my favorite, blah, blah, blah. And you never know what it's going to be. Like you think, you know, what's going to be their favorites, but you never actually know. And they surprise you about the things that they want to keep and the things that they are completely like they spent all their time with it in high school, but then they're like, yeah, whatever that was back then. And I don't care now. So you're always surprised. You will always be surprised by what they pick and what they don't pick. Janice says, uh, points out it will be hundreds of dollars to ship my adult child's yearbooks, other books and heavy items. So y you might want to, I guess, prioritize, prioritize by size and weight. If you have mm -hmm. a cash like that, that you w would like to ship to your kid, take photos of the, the, you know, the biggest and heaviest items and say, do you still want this? If there's anything you can call at the front end and they say no no i don't that i have a much better one of those let that desk go right um elizabeth says that's a good way I, to filter i had been keeping a little eiffel tower statue that reminded me of when my daughter got to go to paris with her dad years passed and just last month she looked at it and said and said oh i have a smaller one of those you can toss that oh there you go yeah it's okay, good we, to ask we are about out of time and we still need to talk about next week and the tittle. Okay. So we're going to be back next week at the usual time, Tuesday, April 16th, noon U.S. Central Time, live in Zoom and streaming on Facebook. We've gotten many requests to talk more about negative emotions that complicate and compound the difficulty of managing clutter. Guilt, shame, fear, grief, anger, and other painful feelings reduce our ability to concentrate and to make decisions. And cluttered spaces and piles of stuff can, in turn, aggravate the emotional distress. Mm -hmm. We're going to offer ideas to help you work around or through the, ne the negative, negative emotions. Join us on April 16th for Vicious Cycle, Clutter as a Symptom and Cause of Negative Emotions. Gail, why don't you give us the tittle? All right. This week's tittle is Cherish the Earth. This week's assignment is to make a plan or take an action in recognition of Earth Day as uh, our viewer lovely suggested, identify an area of your life in which you might be able to reduce your overall consumption, um, reduce your consumption of plastic items or items packaged in excessive plastic, recycle more effectively, use things more completely, donate conscientiously, upcycle waste, or otherwise get a longer life out of the stuff that you choose to own. Write a resolution or affirmation about the change you plan to make. And take at least one action this week to fulfill or move forward with your Earth Day commitment. Hopefully you can uh, make an attempt to 
recycle, upcycle, reuse, relocate something uh, so that it goes out of your house and does not go to a landfill. <laughs> That's the goal. And since this year their focus is on plastic, then looking at uh, your consumption of plastic items and plastic packaging, I'm trying to make a few choices around that would be really wonderful. And come back and tell us how it goes. Excellent. I'm going to share one more comment because it's so useful. Um, I haven't had a chance to check out the link, but but I will vet it and put it in the show notes. Okay. And, and who's with us on Facebook says a great resource for economical shipping is using uship.com, letter U S H I P.com. Online vetted shipping, independent shippers bid and quote each individual job and piggyback shared loads. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so they're so, already um, driving around doing stuff and they might pick you up for a bid yeah, amount. Add you in if they're the winning bid on your project, I guess. Right. That's cool. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> if you're watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live. To get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from our audience, so please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere that you find us. You can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. You know we love to see you every week, and we will be back next week with our next conversation. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.